Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we got Jay Cowie. He is the co-founder and managing partner of Supercritical. Jay, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. Thanks, Josh. It's great to be here today. Appreciate you being here. Tell us a little bit about how uh, you got into the game, what Supercritical is, and what it's all about. Uh, Supercritical, we can start there. We are a Chicago-based firm, cannabis, hemp the legal side of cannabis and hemp advisory and solutions provider. So we're working with startups, we're working with existing companies, helping them uh, through all processes of developing their business. Now, I know that sounds like a, a broad, broad statement. Uh, to get a little more granular on that, we can do uh, application support, application work, uh, Sparky Rose, one of our partners, also co-owns a cannabis branding and marketing firm. So we can build out a pretty good deck for you to, from the ground on up. Carrie Jordan, our third partner, is a CFA, so we can perform those due diligence tests uh, and background, not background checks, but due, di due diligence work uh, that are very, very important, especially for the startup communities. So our goal is to assist, aid through every step of the process, and frankly, uh, build a relationship, one that's enduring and one that doesn't end at the end the, of the application period. That's interesting you mentioned a CFA because I know a lot of uh, companies that don't even have a CFO. Um, they'll have a glorified accountant, you know, maybe a controller at best, and they call them a CFO, but really they're just a, a CPA. So tell me a little bit about how or why you kind of went down that road. I think that legal and some kind of financial analyst, uh, CFO, uh, is important. Uh, why did you decide to add that to, um, you know, to your team? Well, between the three of us, I think we bring a diverse skill set. We kind of laughed at the beginning because between Sparky, Carrie, and myself, we realized we didn't have one contact or one network connection in common. So we were able to go out there and cast a broad net that included people that came from that um, the CFA side, the private equity, the hedge fund side of the industry, from Sparky's background, more on the operational side, the plant touching side of the plant, uh, from my exchange background and experience on the product development and what defines trends that consumers look and are driven towards. So the ability to pull all of these diverse yet unifying skill sets together almost demanded that we have you know, a, a financial analyst on board or someone with the ability and capability to uh, run through those numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're preaching to the choir, I would definitely agree with you. It's it's nice to finally hear that and see that maybe the industry is maturing or you guys are just five years ahead of your time. I don't well, know. That, that brings up a good point. And, and thank you for that too, Josh. I think five years ahead of the time, but at the same time, uh, because we conduct ourselves in this methodical uh, almost a baby step manner, um, we do things the right way. And in this industry, there's a dearth of ethics. And it continues to boggle my mind. And I know with Carrie too, and Sparky, of course, you know, coming from our backgrounds, especially from me coming from a highly regulated industry, right? Regulated by the SEC, CFTC, FINRA, and then internally to the exchanges, we're all bound by compliance and regulatory obligations. And so many people who come into the cannabis space have seemingly thrown those aside or forgotten about them. And we, again, like to encourage people to take that slow, prudent path towards success and do it ethically. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about valuations real quick, because uh, you have analysts on your team. You've been in the industry a while. And with the Chicago Board of uh, Options, or yeah, the options case, CBOE, the CBOE, you've got a lot of experience in seeing the commodity market and cannabis becoming a commodity in and of itself. I'm wondering about, first off, with valuations and businesses, and then we'll get to the crop. Um, before, people were kind of throwing out these valuations, crazy valuations, you know, $2 million for this stock, and it wasn't worth anything. Even recently, I think in August of 2018, we saw maybe it was Weed Maps that had a $420 million valuation, which is kind of arbitrary in the industry to say anything is 420. So I'm curious how you guys, either in the past or now, value companies. There seems to be more options to kind of go out and pick the easy numbers, which is um, just the comps. If you look at um, 
different comparables. That might be the easier thing. Is there other ways that you guys are valuing companies that aren't so easy? And how have you seen that progress in valuations over the years? Well, certainly industry comparisons are the best or a good first place to start. But what it really comes down to is the team that represents that project, that endeavor, um, what is our belief in them and their vision and their goal? Are they meeting the milestones? Do they have their own vision of a prudent path to success? Because that plays a lot in determining the valuation of the company because people tend to overestimate their net and self-worth when they're building companies, it seems. That still goes on. So what we focus a lot on is reining in and helping them manage their own expectations. And if that means bringing their valuation down so they can get closer to bringing in that lead investor, they understand that exercise. Because at the end of the day, getting that first lead investor in, that's half the battle right there. Um, that will bring the others in. And then you can change the valuations as you move further down the road. Mm -hmm. What about the, the commoditization of cannabis? Do you think that branding is going to kind of branch off and then each company is going to be valued differently than the crop itself? Right now, it kind of seems like we're still in this agricultural mindset rather than a branding concept and, and splitting that from you know crop or commodity and, and brands. Um, when do you kind of see that, that split happening and uh, the commoditization with the futures market happening? Do you think that's even possible with the variations in strains and whatnot? Um, personally, I do not. And I think it's because there are so many brands. Now, on one side of the house, there's hemp. And we can talk about hemp separately, how it is a true commodity and it is a textile and it should be considered not unlike corn, wheat, oats, or soybeans. On the THC side of the house, you have these brands. To weave it all together, if you think there's going to be a time where you're going to trade Blue Dream as a futures product or on a listed exchange, I, I think that's a far way off, if for nothing else, because the hallmark of any listed futures contract is standardization. So that I know if I'm trading corn at the board of trade, it's yellow corn number six or hard red wheat number 12. Um, because there are so many variations in the way particular strains are grown, in addition to the Appalachians, um, their consistency can sometimes be questioned. And what it comes down to for me is Tylenol is Tylenol is Tylenol. I know that I can go to Denver, San Francisco, Chicago, and I'm buying the same kind of Tylenol. If I buy Blue Dream to treat one particular personal ailment, there's no guarantee that the Blue Dream I get in Denver, San Francisco, and Chicago are identical at the, uh, I guess, the phytochemical levels. Ergo, outcomes could change if we value that plant at the medical level. So personally, I think that makes it harder to standardize when there are applications of the product that could change depending on the area that it may be grown or how it is grown. Um, again, when Archer Daniels Midland is making or taking deliveries of soybeans, those are um, soybeans with a standardized component to it, weight, um, condition of that seed. There's probably uh, diameters that have to be met for these particular soybeans. Um, so yeah, standardization I think is key. Now, I think it's easier to get the standardization on the hemp side of the house. Hmm. Why or how? Because I think there's just more uh, tangible applications around hemp, even away from CBD. So we've got you know, the CBD part of the plant, uh, but honestly, I think the real value in the plant is around the fibrous properties of the mm -hmm. plant, the things you can do around hempcrete or um, using hemp as a replacement to single use plastics. Um, that makes applications of cannabis a lot more attractive to investors if they know that this particular application of cannabis has an ESG component to it. So it's harder to sell a cannabis investment that 
focuses entirely on the recreational side, not impossible. I, I think it's, again, my personal observation is it's easier on the hemp side because there are investors who are um, alert to the cannabis market, but want to stay away from the recreational side, understand a little bit about what CBD can does. They know it's available widely and over the counter, but they've, they've also become more acutely aware recently of the other properties of hemp. So now there's an opportunity for them to invest in a part of the plant that doesn't have that psychoactive side to it. So I think it becomes a softer entry for investors added to the fact that there's more you can do with the hemp parts of the plant um, currently than with the THC side of the house. So again, if you're gonna go back to hemp concrete, hemp bricks, uh, clothing, um, nutraceuticals, uh, replacements for fossil fuels. Yeah, I think that really makes the conversation a lot more gripping and kind of steers the folks away from anything negatively that people may um, think about when they think of cannabis. Right. Yeah, actually, we just did, um, a, it was episode 666 this morning. So we did a sin stock episode, talked all about that. Um, so yeah, definitely interesting about that as well. I, I want to ask you about the difference, though, with fiber in the futures market and having, you know, options eventually. Um, it sounds like fiber is one thing because you can, it's consistent, right? Whereas, you know, maybe he smokable hemp or smokable cannabis isn't consistent. Do you know what the difference is then with tobacco? Like, how does a tobacco farmer have that consistency and is there just one kind of variety of tobacco or, or strain or whatever you want to call it? What's the difference between tobacco and cannabis in commoditization? Hey, great question to which I don't have an answer for. I would hazard a guess by saying that tobacco, and I'm not a tobacco smoker, but I would think that it got to where it's at uh, through selective breeding. Mm. Um, and just engineering the plant to produce the outcomes that the tobacco manufacturers want on the shelves. Um, is today's tobacco crop the same crop it was 400 years ago? Probably an entirely different plant back then. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me a little bit about your experience, the Chicago Board of Options Exchanges, right? CBOE, is that what it stands for? That was one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, fascinating. We're kind of getting to that point where cannabis and hemp are going to be uh, more traded than they already are. I think we're, we're seeing that right now. Was it Sundial, a uh, company that's getting wrapped up into that uh, Wall Street bets phenomenon and mm -hmm. everything? So it's the gamification. We're starting to see a lot less people like yourself on the floor um, <laughs> and a lot more people on, on these apps. Um, tell me about when you were on the floor, because that's that's a, a bygone era. Yeah, it is. And um, um, it still exists to a degree in, in some spots and in some contracts. Uh, I was feel grateful to have experienced it and survived it all. <laughs> um, and it was at a time, I think, where it was much more easier to compete in those markets. Um, like a lot of Chicagoans, I just kind of made my way to the trading floor. And I was always dug going down to the visitor's gallery as a struggling musician. Back in those days, I had time. And I knew some guys that worked on the floor as runners or grunt positions. And really dug just looking at the price boards and kind of drawing the, the correlations and comparisons between the markets and doing my own anal anal analytics around the markets. I don't have a background in business, finance, or education. Uh, really driven by the allure of open outcry, the last bastion of capitalism, as they said, in trading places, right? So um, I'm a bit of a commodity myself and that I'm six foot two, 200 pounds, and that works well on a trading floor where there's a sea of people and if you can stand above. Um, long, long way of saying I made my way to the floor, got a job as a runner, and I was hooked. You know, just running paper orders to the wheat broker or the corn broker and just looking at the order and looking at the price board and trying to figure out is this client going to get filled and it was fantastic. I was hooked. Um, worked my way up through the system 
and became a uh, exchange member at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 1987, trading stock index futures uh, based off of S&P. So truly open outcry in what was probably uh, the heyday of trading stock index futures and, and Euro dollars. Um, the crash of 87, I was, I was there for that. Um, now I'm showing my age, but certainly it was a um, education on my feet. Again, no background in business or economics. It was more uh, education on your feet and learning to read the crowd, looking across and seeing that Josh has just bought a 500 lot and the market is turning south. So when is Josh gonna puke out of this position? You know, I'm going to keep my hands down. Everyone else is going to wait until the sweat appears on your forehead. <laughs> and then we might, you know, put out a, a meek bid so we help you out. Um, that's not present on the screen, right? Those kind of psychological um, edges. And as the industry transitioned from open outcry to more of an electronically trading, I transitioned through, I think, with every facet I, I could from working um, as a, the broker for one of Chicago's leading proprietary houses, built my own book of business and yeah, embraced open outcry with a partner. You and I would, you know, do the trade between the pit and the screen, but before you know it, everyone and their brother and sister were doing that. Um, I did open outcry for probably 16, 17 years. Uh, my decision to step away from it was at the time that CME was going through their IPO. Um, see how that played out, but I, I wasn't out of the the crowd for long because uh, I knew people at SIBO and was aware that they were starting up a, an exchange within the exchange, and I was asked in as the first hire uh, for the CFE, which was the SIBO Futures Exchange, mm -hmm. and that was uh, an exchange within the exchange uh, dedicated solely to products around VIX or the Volatility Index. CBOE had been calculating the vol volatility index since 1993. And as a floor trader, we would look at the price board and use that as a reference mark. Um, so now fast forward 2004, it's probably time to consider commoditizing or productizing in a much heralded and used index. So that's what we did in 2004 and listed VIX futures. Um, short order cook kind of job in those days. Uh, answering the phones and doing marketing and business development. And over time, um, we were able to build a team of industry professionals, business development directors that went out across the globe and explained the value of volatility, not as an asset class, not originally. You know, we let the market decide that, but why volatility, um, augmenting to volatility is an important part of risk management in a portfolio. Not for all, for some, um, but we saw what we saw happen is volatility did indeed declare itself in this, as an asset class. A number of other products were built uh, on the VIX methodology, some of the banks creating structured notes or products that um, were intended for their client use or their own industry reference benchmarks that they built products for. So this whole asset class based around volatility evolved. And I was thrilled, happy, and very grateful to be part of that on behalf of the exchange and left in 2019 as senior manager of business development for that effort. Hmm. That's fascinating. So do you think that there's going to be an option for delivery if, if hemp ends up, you know, hemp fiber, for example, ends up on the, on the market as a futures option with, um, a lot of things like, I don't think pork, for example, I don't think pigs are, are delivered anymore. There's certain commodities that are delivered and are not. And I'm wondering, or I'm curious if you can kind of talk about it through an example, um, assuming that hemp or, or cannabis is going to be um, you know, on the futures market. How does that work? Like if I'm a market maker and you're in the pit and you know, you're, you're flashing your, your sign of what you're looking at to buy, can you run us through a scenario on what that looks like from floor to delivery? Sure. Um, actually, once the trade is executed between Jay and Josh, depending on what side of the market we're on and depending on the contract expiry, if we're trading a current contract that's settling next Wednesday, um, we both have until there's probably a cutoff period the day before to decide if we're going to cash settle that 
or make or take delivery. And we would have to, if you're looking to take delivery and I'm looking to make delivery, we have to sign these um, basically letters of intent that uh, indicate that Jay is going to deliver 5,000 bushels of um, corn, yellow corn number six to Sioux City, Iowa, because uh, that's the green elevator that's part of the network of elevators, at which point, you know, Josh and uh, Josh's uh, processing company will pick up the 5,000 bushels, be handed the cert certificate of delivery, and now you own the 5,000 bushels of corn, wheat, or beans, whatever we um, transacted in. Pretty standard, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, the vast majority of those grain contracts still traded at the Board of Trade are cash settled. Hmm. Because what's going on, of course, is in the cash market behind the scene. That's where the physical delivery is taking place. The futures markets are, uh, I don't want to say merely, but they operate as or they exist as a hedge for adverse price movements in the, in the cash market. Um, now, is Archer Daniel Midland uh, making or taking delivery? Yes, of course they are, because they have customers that they need to oblige for uh, producing the products that you know we buy on the shelf. So yeah, there is a percentage, and it's generally done by those larger producers that are still making or taking delivery. What do you make of the volatility right now? The markets are kind of down. There's been a lot of shifting and outflows from equities to more speculative, uh, you know, <laughs> in crypto. Uh, it used to be that IPOs were the speculative thing. And now you got cryptos and might as well throw housing in there and anything else that uh, is parabolic right now. I'm curious about um, your take on, on volatility with the market right now. Is that a good sign? Are we looking at a potential correction? Um, and what that means for the overall market as we're seeing basically the entire cannabis industry like red day after day. Um, is that a good thing? I think it's good for cannabis because it puts the cannabis industry in the same class and element as equities, commodities, metals. Because what's going on right now, especially in the equities, is this big rotation, right? Out of um, a lot of the high tech stocks to be sure, you know, Powell's statement about um, interest rates and the, the bond yields kind of kind of spooked the market, but it hasn't kept people out of the market. They're just rotating out of certain sectors into others. Uh, and the more cannabis is part of that discussion, I think it validates our role in the um, in the market overall. Uh, because now we become a different asset class, be it on the hemp side or these publicly traded cannabis companies. To be part of the discussion, I think, is important. And I don't think it could have come at a better time, especially if with a um, perceived friendlier administration uh, guiding a path towards eventual legalization. So now full legalization means full investment, right? Yeah, well, hopefully. But I think it's an interesting time to be in the market. And if you're talking about volatility in general, uh, it's I think it's a <laughs> it's far from being over because recent stories are talking about a new commodity super cycle uh, starting, um, and that's always fun, right? Because those are easy darts to throw at the board when everything's uh, correlated together. Is that a harbinger though that there's a commodity super cycle coming? Um... Is that a bellwether or any indicator that we're going to see some headwinds on the market? Because I'm curious when we talked a little bit about sin stocks, um, just from my brief, you know, history on this planet and seeing sin stocks, there seems to be an inverse relationship when there's a market correction because they've been um, systematically depressed by about 20% or so from institutional investors not wanting to touch it. And having you know maybe sin clauses for other uh, funds that can invest into it, so that when everything kind of collapses, people are looking at value and saying, ah, maybe we'll let the ESG or that that social responsibility investing, um, we'll kind of let that slide and and go after what's what's valuable, including now cannabis for the first time, uh, for that next. Uh, depression, recession, correction, whatever it is, whenever this longest bull market in history stops, 
um, cannabis is is ripe for the taking. Whether or not those companies actually deserve those valuations is another story ripe for consolidation, maybe. Um, just kind of curious about sin stocks, volatility, um, you know, anything you kind of want to add to the speculative market that we're kind of seeing right now? Is there opportunity out there? What are you looking at? Yeah, I think there's ample opportunity across the entire cannabis sector. Um, people have to remember and realize that this is more than just a plant that provides recreational relief or value. You have to look at cannabis as an industry disruptor, right? It is not unlike Uber. I think it's fair to say it's not unlike Uber and what Uber did to the hired car services. If you look at cannabis beyond the recreational part of the plant, um, we have the good fortune of working with a a large group of industry professionals in Chicago supporting city colleges of Chicago, uh, building out curriculum. And originally the colleges put focus on dispensary operations and they felt that was the quickest and easiest path to get students into the industry. And with some encouragement and guidance from again, super critical and a number of others, um, the, we're helping them understand there are opportunities on the agricultural side of the plant on the consumer package good side of the plant, on the social activist side of the plant. Um, this industry is just beginning to grow. And um, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to know that there are gonna be companies formed that are going to employ hundreds if not thousands of people around this humble little plant that so many people went to jail for. Mm -hmm. So will it be volatile? Absolutely. Will there be consolidation? Absolutely. It happens in every industry and in every, um, yeah, in every industry segment, the, there will be consolidations across probably MSOs. There will be consolidation across technologies because there's a lot of cutting edge technology that's currently taking place from the soil to above the soil. Um, and joint ventures will be formed, relationships will be um, needed to be formed and companies and groups are gonna to come together and form uh, unique networks that are focused entirely on bringing the value out of the plant. So, yeah, but that doesn't come out, that doesn't come without a little volatility. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would go, nope. go ahead, oh no. I was going to, I want to ask uh, about, you know, individually what you're looking at investing for the rest of this year and into 2022. But I want to ask about the probability of, of just everyone getting sidestepped. If the medical aspect takes hold and the perceived, you know, the, the, the administration's perceived, um, you know, acceptance of, of cannabis, uh, really turns into a schedule two and big farm is the only ones who can touch it. Uh, is that, is that an option out there? What's the probability of, of a schedule two happening and only big pharma getting involved? Uh, I sure hope that doesn't happen because <laughs> I think the industry has to stay true to its origins and remember that this was a agronomy business that was executed on by farmers, humble people that took to the hills, that believed in the plant, if not just for their own personal use, but believed in the long-term value of the plant and building their own cottage industries, mom and pop operations, right? So maybe there needs to be a cannabis coalition formed before Big Pharma gets too far involved in order to represent uh, the independence, um, because it's the independence that helped get us here, right? It's the black and brown people that were arrested for low cannabis offenses, that there are social equity programs in place, and we still need to fix a lot going on with there. And I don't want to see things like that get kind of swept under the rug, the important things that are helping build this industry. We need to ensure that the industry remains diverse, inclusive. And if you say big farmer, I'm just thinking, you know, a bunch of guys in white coats um, and, and the industry has to be more than that. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the answer then? Do we create an SRO 
in the financial world, we have a self-regulatory organization that is a buffer between government and the financial institutions themselves that, in a sense, work for the banks to create legislature to give it to the government and in some cases make it so complex that senators don't want to ask questions to look stupid, so they just pass all of these bills. That's obviously my opinion. Uh, not really facts, my opinion. <laughs> but I'm curious about SROs and if that's the answer to cannabis is to create the legislator to have a buffer in between government and business to have more of a, a say in how things are being regulated to get away from you know, big pharma and more towards small business and the people to open it up. I think that presumes that we're operating in a legal industry. Right. And I think it becomes a lot easier if cannabis were not on any schedule, and which is deemed a, a product uh, for consumption, medicine, recreation, et cetera, commodity. Um, then you can create, if it's federally legal, the federal regulations around it. And then you can provide the oversight that's important to enforcing that regulation. Uh, I like the idea of a self regulatory. Uh, how enforceable is that when we're still under a federal mandate that prohibits the plant? Right, right. Yeah, but in the eventuality that it is federally legal, I like how the banking system utilizes an SRO to keep the government out of their business. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, I would agree that it's probably part of the, or should be part of the framework. Uh, I go back to what I said earlier, I think there needs to be um, coalitions formed industry participants of every ilk. And I'm not saying MSO shouldn't be part of the discussion, but I think the preponderance of the people um, in this coalition co-op, call it what you will, should be um, focused or skewed more towards the independents, making sure that the independents um, have a voice. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the, the section where I ask you to uh, clean your crystal ball and uh, entertain me for a second. Wow. So I put together um, a, a little list here of cannabis 2021 predictions. So this is taken from about 14 sources. It's a small data set. Um, within that, there's maybe 40, 45 different uh, components, which has all been aggregated into the prediction list here. Uh, with 40, almost 42% saying that legal and regulation regulations and and politics is going to be the focal point of this year. Uh, price and profit was number one last year. Um, now that's down to number seven and only 8% think that that's going to be uh, the the main prediction this year. So I'm wondering with with you guys at Supercritical, where you guys lie at with in terms of this, you know, predictions and or what else you guys are thinking about from, you know, investment surging this year after the House and Senate and uh, administration is democratic controlled to international expansion or with the demand from cannabis last year being deemed essential business, uh, rare cannabinoids at number four, 11% think that, you know, more, more cannabinoids are going to hit the market, hemp and CBD being strong, or maybe consolidation at 16%, people thinking that market is going to capitulate a little bit more. Where are you at, Jay, and, and super critical in terms of your predictions and the direction you guys are uh, throwing your money at? <laughs> I would agree with um, certainly legal regulation and political being number one. Uh, and to your point, yeah, based on the discussions we're having and the people uh, that we're working with, I would bump cannabinoids and hemp to number two and three. Again, recognizing hemp for that true commodity that it is and the softer path to cannabis investment. Um, cannabinoids are going to be huge without a doubt. That's just, you know, tip of the iceberg stuff we're discovering about cannabinoids and terpenes too. Um, CBG, CBN, CBDA. Um, education is going to have to lead the way, but I think they're going to be part more or more of the discussion, especially with my new number four, which would be investment surges, because people are recognizing investments or investors, I should say, are recognizing that there's more than plant than THC uh, and CBD. For the most part, uh, and I agree, we agree, um, the CBD market is very oversaturated. 
but what's this about CBN or CBG or THCA or Delta-8? So I think the cannabinoids are going to be part of the broadening discussion as we develop this uh, quasi-asset class or industry sector. Uh, demand, I would almost take off that list because demand will always exist. Um, so I had legal regulation, hemp cannabinoids, um, investment surges definitely behind that. I would put demand, then consolidation, um, price and profit. Uh, there's a lot of focus on that. I mean, there's prices are going to have to come down. The wholesale prices are eventually going to have to come down. It, there's just no doubt about, about it. When and how fast, I mean, that's going to add to the price volatility right there. Mm -hmm. um, international, do we have some focus on there? Yeah, we do have international uh, partners that we're working with, but the, that's more so on um, low THC or CBD uh, period. Um, it's not a big part of our day. Let's talk about price and profit for a little bit, because how do we get the wholesale price down? I think the best way to do that is to um, just put more product out there, right? And the way you put more product out there is to have some kind of maybe legal framework at the federal level, once it goes off federal, um, that allows for more dispensaries around state's original medical marijuana pilot programs here in Illinois. We're still kind of bound to those original pilot program terms and terms of who can grow, how much they can grow and who got in first. Um, the more you have an open market structure, um, you can meet the demand, bring down the wholesale prices. And then what happens after that? Oh yeah, consolidation can then start occurring. But at the same time that you're increasing the demand and bringing more online, you're opening up opportunities for other people to get uh, involved in the space on the ancillary part of the areas because with more demand, I expect more transport uh, to be in demand. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether that's uh, B2B or uh, be the consumer, um, that'll be a growing part of the industry as uh, wholesale prices come down. That's the kind of thread I'm pulling together. Right. Yeah, we're, we're in Washington State, where I'm at in Seattle, we're only buying on average 30 to $40 per visit in Chicago, you guys are spending about $110. Maybe that's coming from, you know, the border states or whatever else. Um, but obviously, these, uh, these new onboarding states are going to be spending a lot, um, as some of us are kind of just buy it when we want. Uh, and it's more convenient. <clears throat> I think as things kind of normalize and we start looking at international orders and wholesale orders, I'm looking at the Canadian market because they're already federal legal and I'm scratching my head asking, what's going on with the, the government kind of controlling or protecting this, this protectionism by not allowing Colombian importation uh, into Canada? So do you have any insight into why Canada would close down, um, you know, quarter million dollar greenhouses and then stop producing in Colombia with good terroir and cheap labor uh, and then continue to, to spend $6 per gram when we're already doing it for a buck 30 in the US? Uh, why aren't they leading the charge and having first mover advantages rather than protectionism? Leading question. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was. Uh, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I, my kind of general sense about what's happening on the, the flower side of Canada, and make no mistake, we're working with quite a few cutting edge Canadian companies away from plant touching. But I think there was a lot of lessons learned with what happened with the rollout of Canadian grows, Canadian legalization, access, to the plant that there, there feels a, a general reluctance to get out of their comfort zone. Hmm. Now that's going to be short lived. And I think you'll see them again, prominent in some global deals. Um, they're, they know what they're doing there. I think they just had some bad business practices um, set them up to fail. Hmm. Yeah, they got to move a lot quicker. I mean, being the second country, they they have a lot to lose if they don't move fast. So um, I think their first move advantage is is, is uh, slipping away like intrinsic value on an option. There you go with that analogy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> 
Anything else that we uh, we miss? I want to um, want to talk a little bit more about your history, but before we we do that, is there anything that you want to talk about um, that we haven't already? Uh, we're excited. I am especially excited, you know, having come out of nearly 40 years of derivatives and how do I kind of cobble together all of the acumen um, from putting the, together that career, working on product development, business development, um, recognizing the value of the plant and how do we share those knowledges with the students of tomorrow. So again, going back to our work with the colleges, you know, we have, we have to remember that's the students of today that are going to lead the businesses of tomorrow. So I'm thrilled about what the future holds for the students because it's transcended so far beyond a recreational product. And then to give the students the tools to go out there and build their own identities and careers in areas that they may have not even contemplated being associated with cannabis. Again, as a consumer packaged good. The industry needs people that can come up with nifty branding, marketing, slogans, packagings, looks. And as a graphic artist who may not be a stoner, I may have not thought about that back in the day, but now my college is offering courses that are specific to my field of interest related to cannabis. I mean, that, that's pretty powerful. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's huge. Um, not sure where I would have gone if that was offered uh, at my liberal college here in, in Washington. <laughs> you would have been a uh, probably primo grower by now, right? Probably, yeah. Um, except, I mean, like you said, you you know, you didn't have the the background or the education, but you got it from the street. And I think there's you can learn so much more. It's like when you study for all these investment licenses, there's a difference between the book and real world. Same with college. Yeah. You go to college and you study, and I'm not even sure why most people go. I have two undergraduates, three minors, and a master's, and I wouldn't advise anybody go because you learn. I've learned so much more as an entrepreneur than my master's in finance, my MBA, my undergraduate in accounting and international business ever taught me. And I'm sure the same is for you. You learn more on the floor than you would have ever learned from a book. So um, we would see guys on the floor, you know, it came from, you know, with the financial degrees or the, the studies that you went through and they got onto the floor and the floor is, you know, it's all about gut reaction and kind of having that horse sense and not being entirely too stubborn. And we'd see these guys either in the pit or outside the pit and they got their charts and they look at the board and look in the pit and they're marking down and it's snooze you lose, right? Because when they reach a point where the chart confirms, they're you know trying to get their order in the pit, but, but the price is gone. So yeah, you develop those kind of innate senses if you're um, always trial by fire. <laughs> right, yeah. We talked a lot about Supercritical and some options, crystal ball predictions, which you guys are going to be uh, involved with. Anything else that you guys are looking forward to either for this year or next year? Anything else that you are, uh, that you got your hands in? I know that you're, you're heavily involved and uh, the industry moves quick. So there's a lot of things to, to get involved with. Uh, what, what else are you doing? Again, we like the biotech side of the plant. Um, how do you grow it better, stronger, faster? And, increase the yields, uh, make it less, uh, make it more resistant, I should say, to things like pathogens, pesticides, molds. So the ability to work with companies that are promoting uh, the plant through science without, you know, technically, genetically altering it, I think is exciting. Um, the ability to work with companies that, again, are going to disrupt the fossil fuel industry, uh, I think are not only important uh, but are super critical to society. Um, we do keep a watchful eye on what we think is a, a next trend in personal well wellness, and that's around uh, adaptogenic plants and ethiogens. So psilocybin in particular, um, mescaline, um, those two for starters, there's others, but I think psilocybin is kind of leading the way in terms of microdosing around personal wellness and treating some disorders that maybe cannabis doesn't offer that path to. Mm -hmm. uh, people tend to, not tend to, a lot of people kind of think they're running parallel paths or want to lump them together. 
Uh, yes, they are personal liberties and yes, they are part of wellness, but they are entirely two different plants. They should be considered and valued as different in industries with different skill sets of people who are involved in them. Uh, their own only commonality is that they allow people to make the individual decisions themselves uh, beyond getting a prescription. Now, are there care providers that are going to guide you through your your psilocybin experience? Of course, that there are. Uh, but probably in the day there, I needed someone back in the day to guide me through my first joint. Uh, mm -hmm. So over time with the education, I think um, the whole wellness space in general um, will be a focus for super critical. Yeah, I know a lot of investment advisors and people in the field that are really excited about psilocybin and its ability to reset depression. Um, Dr. Allison Drayson, she's uh, with the Ames Institute in Seattle, another person that's uh, on top of all of that and really excited. Um, people were really excited about MSOs, and I think uh, Cresco Labs might be one of the um, the bigger companies in in Chicago. Are, are you... Um, affiliate or do you work with them at all are you excited as much as uh, the pr uh, the press releases are <laughs> um as part of the cannabis advisory committee work um we do we are familiar and associated with uh cresco on a couple of those college projects but uh beyond that there's no professional relationship between supercritical or and, and cresco at, at this point but certainly welcome uh that discussion uh, when I look at their products, good, fine products, I, I like uh, how they present themselves. Um, but Josh, at the end of the day, there's a, a lot of companies out there that are providing, um, I think, these kind of unique entry points into the market, whether that's um, smaller little mini joints or whether that's low dose edibles, they all seem to be doing variations of the other. I think what differ differentiates some are those that are looking to take edibles and introduce botanicals into them. Because so I think there's some people out there who are more curious about their cannabis if it tastes like cucumber. Uh, don't count me among them. Um, and again, any of the companies that are promoting it more so on the wellness side rather than on the straight rec side. But if you were to put a Cresco product in front of me next to a cookies product, next to uh, a holistic product outside the packaging, I wouldn't be able to discern any difference in taste, smell, or origin. So what's that tell me? That comes down to the branding, packaging, and marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I think with that, we should probably roll this one up. Um, how can people get a hold of you, Jay? Where where are you at on uh, for um, emails or websites? How could people get a hold of you and and see what Supercritical is doing? Jay at Supercritical dot agency, or Sparky at Supercritical dot agency, or Carrie at Supercritical dot agency, or the best way probably is info at Supercritical dot agency. We are all on LinkedIn and we would love to connect with you all. Yeah, we'll have some of those links in the show notes as well. So with that, I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Jay Cowie. He is the co-founder, managing partner with Supercritical. Jay, <clears throat> appreciate you being on the Talking Hedge. Thank you, Josh. It's been a pleasant chat with you and all the best to you going forward. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.